Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So most Dhamma talks tend to focus on the bright qualities in the heart. They, uh, we speak often of loving kindness and these methods of bringing the mind to a state of liberation, of luminosity. And we rarely speak of the shadow and of the fact that the world is riven and woven with darkness too. And I remember hearing that with post-traumatic stress syndrome and uh, some forms of trauma, the rupture in someone is caused by encountering an act um, either done by themselves or that they witness which is beyond their framework of experience and of language that doesn't fit into the story or the conception of reality and therefore can't be integrated into the mind and, and the heart. It can't be metabolized. And the spectrum of good and evil which exists in the world is such that some of the language that we have to use is archetypal in nature and even religious. Um, some of the things that exist in the world and that we encounter um, need the language of evil to speak about, of malevolence, of the demonic, and of the shadow. And unless we can speak to those occasionally and have a language and a way of describing them, then if we, we don't ever do that, then we don't have a way of understanding them and of fitting them into the framework of how we look at the world. And in Buddhism, the uh, wheel of dependent origination, which we spoke of last week, because of scale and variance, um, that cycle of rebirth and the lives we can take and be born into Yes, they can occur moment to moment, and they can occur across lifetimes in a Buddhist conception. And similarly, these patterns, sankara we call them, of wholesomeness, of unwholesomeness, of skillful and unskillful, of good and evil, to use very uh, biblical terms, are also patterns we encounter. And in a Buddhist conception, those patterns are transient. Um, they're conditioned by natural law. And they aren't damning in the sense that even if one of these patterns is woven into one, even if one has these sankara, these programs running internally in the heart and mind, or even if one encounters these in the world, they can change, they can soften with practice and eventually dissolve. And so the hells and the heavens in Buddhism are impermanent and the suttas are filled with the stories of murderers redeemed, Angulimala, who the scriptures tell us uh, killed 999 people, which I think just means a lot. <laughs> and. Uh, and yet eventually became an enlightened 
a disciple of the Buddha. We have the figure of Mahamogalana, who in one story confronts Mara, the supreme overlord of samsara, and tells him that once he himself, just in a previous lifetime, was uh, Amara, had been reborn in the same uh, station of evil or of deception. And so no one is beyond redemption. And all evil we do is out of ignorance of what's truly for our long-lasting benefit. Even those who are consumed by difficult and damaging patterning, it's all from ignorance and out of blindness. And yet those patterns do exist. There is true malevolence in the world. And so to have a way of speaking about it and understanding that um, there is shadow as well as light helps us truly give ourselves to practice in the way that it deserves. It lets us metabolize the, the difficulty and the pain we see in a world that has been and is touched with genocide and with so many other forms of difficulty and, and um, damage. So the Buddhist cosmology gives us a uh, great and very uh, a spectrum of language for these uh, patterns. We have the realm of hungry ghosts, the pretas, um, to speak about the shadow of the mind which is obsessive, uh, constantly hungry and searching. We have the realms of the asuras, the angry gods. We have uh, the demonic, the, the hell realms. And once again, these are all realms we can think of as in the mind. We've all had days where we've spent in the hell realm. We've all had plenty of hungry ghost days. We might be having one today. And to see that these are pieces of ourselves and to learn how to interact with them, to know their flavor. And this lets us, when we can understand them as just other characters in this cosmology of the mind, then we're able to see them, understand them for what they are, and then hopefully find a skillful way of befriending or of protecting or of satiating them and of moving past. So perhaps the most common one that many of us come into contact with is the hungry ghost realm. And many people will know these. These are the pretas. Um, they are usually depicted as beings with teeny thin necks and gigantic bellies, uh, always hungry and yet never able to take in enough food through kind of these pinhole mouths that they have to actually ever be satiated. And this is one good depiction, but the Preta realm, the hungry ghost realm, is also about obsessiveness. It's about the sense of rattling around an old pattern about fixation. So there's one story I love to tell of a group of monks traveling through Thailand, and they find an old abandoned hut to sleep in for the night, and they all lie down, and all of their heads are in a row, but their feet are out of kilter. And so uh, a ghost who lives in the house sort of comes to them and is a bit off-put by their um, disorderly feet. And so he kind of arranges their feet into a straight line and then stands up and takes a look and realizes that all their heads are out of order now. And so he goes to the other side and sort of sorts their heads out into a straight line again and then realizes that the feet are out of order once again, and back and forth. And this state of an empty, obsessive rattling around, of spiraling around the same doubt, the same pattern, just because it's familiar, this is a hungry ghost mind state. I think 
the state of anxiety, of self-recrimination, of knowing the comfort of a small closet that we've been locked in our, for much of our life. Many of these are of the hungry ghost realm. And to see that when you're in a hungry ghost mind state, how it manifests. And to know that what one does with a hungry ghost is spreads light and does good and then dedicates the goodness. This is a very common practice in Thailand is, and pretty much every culture except Western ones is, or at least in the US, is dedicating merit to the dead. And so in Thailand, you'll see once people give alms, they pour out water, and that's their way of dedicating the goodness to their departed relatives. And so this idea that when we're obsessing in that same old pattern that we're so familiar with, that's colorless and gray, rattling around, to get out of that, to step outside of yourself. Ajahn Sumedho said that, you know, whenever I think of myself, it, I just get depressed. And it's true, uh, there's such a healing I power agree. to giving and to keeping morality and to focusing on alleviating others' suffering. So this is how you deal with a hungry ghost, is you dedicate goodness to another. You do good acts and bring to mind the heart and the spirit that you want to dedicate to. And that's how you step out of your own depression too, is can you step into giving and outside of ourselves? And can you recognize that there is something comforting about a stuffy familiarity and that this is the hungry ghost mind state? There's also the demonic. And this is not something we speak of often in Buddhism. Um, but there's different kind of levels. There's one called the Asuras, which are equivalent to the Titans in uh, uh, Greek mythology. And the Asuras are depicted as angry gods. They're a mere image of the Devas. They live at the bottom of Mount Sinaru. All this is in the commentaries, by the way, but it's, it's really fun. So um, this isn't necessarily the Buddha's words but it's, a Buddhist, it's part of Buddhist cosmology in some sense, and I think it's a very useful depiction of mind state. And the angry gods, the asuras, they spend all day fighting, and then, um, actually I think this is what Norse Valhalla is based on, but they think it's heaven. And the asuras, the asuras also think that they're in heaven, and only every now and again, they'll stare up at the slopes of Mount Sinaru and see the devas, the angels, and realize that they're not in heaven, and then the commentaries say they'll swarm up the edges of the mountain like ants and attack the deva's stronghold. And I think that's so fascinating how the asuras think they're in heaven. Because this sense of anger is so insidious. And most of us know the burn of anger towards a loved one, of the way it kind of scalds the heart. And we also know its attraction, how there's a sense of power of life that comes when you're, you let the rage bubble up and we understand why we go back to that. But what's so interesting is when we can blind ourselves to what's going on and really think we're a deva, but actually we're an asura. And I see this a lot in political discourse. There's a certain brand of compassion you'll hear where some issue comes up and there's a sense of pouring out a certain level of empathy, but it comes hand in hand with a shadow where you know the next sentence or the next paragraph is going to be one directed at those people, whoever they are. And sometimes after that, conversation has happened over the dinner table 10, 20, 30 times, you really get the sense that it's almost, there's almost a sense of feeding off of the issue. And also of a real kind of conceit where in some way we think we're 
angels, but really we've somehow become asuras in that moment. There's a subtle anger and polarization, and the moment we other another person, we've stepped into a realm of, of alienation. We've lost the plot, always being uh, watchful for that movement of the heart. And then there's the real demonic realms of the real forces of evil in the world. And once again, evil is a problematic term in a lot of ways. Uh, it's in a Buddhist conception just based on ignorance. And yet, what happens when you do encounter true malevolence, um, true dark patterns? And to understand that, you know, one really, uh, there's a great story of a demon in the Buddhist suttas. It's called the anger-eating demon. And it takes place in the uh, Tavatingsa heaven, which is the Buddhist equivalent of the Greek Olympia, um, or Olympic mountain, Mount Olympus, whatever it is. And Saka, the equivalent of Zeus, comes back and finds this little demon on the throne. And um, actually, before he gets there, this demon, he's gone. The demon takes the throne, and all of Saka's retinue says, you, you've got to get off of that throne. That's Saka's, that's Saka's throne. And the more angry they get, the more the anger-eating demon becomes larger and stronger and more uh, kind of gathers more gravitas. And then Saka comes, and he says, oh, I know what to do. And, you know, all the other, the retinue are kind of wringing their hands and don't quite know what, what to do about this anger-eating demon. And Saka comes to the demon, and he puts his robe over one, he's not a monk, but he's got a, you know, classic robe, and puts it over one shoulder, and puts his hands on Anjali, and he says, I am Saka, king of the, king of the gods. And he says it three times with his hands in Anjali, which was the most respectful way of greeting someone. And each time he says this and gives this sense of kindness and humility, the demon gets smaller and smaller until it disappears in kind of a poof of smoke. And Saka says, this was an anger-eating demon. And similarly with the means of dispelling resentment that the Buddha gave us, there's a sutta where he says that one who when one encounters one impure in body but pure in speech, one should think of them, one should dispel resentment as a monk in need of cloth would come to a scrap of dirty cloth on the road and using one foot tear the dirty part away from the clean part and picking up the clean part of the cloth walk on. And even so, one looks to the good. One dispels resentment towards one pure in body but impure in speech. Like a person dying of thirst would come to an algae-covered pond and gently scraping away the algae would cup the water in their hands and drink, satiating their thirst and then move on. Even so, one looks to the good. One dispels resentment towards someone impure in body and impure in speech but with occasional moments of mindfulness. So we're, we're going with a low bar here. <laughs> As a person dying of thirst would come to a hoof print in the road and careful not to stir up any silt, would bend down and press their lips to the water and gently drink. Even so, one looks to the good. One dispels resentment towards one impure in body, impure in speech, and without occasional moments of clarity, as one would look at a person wandering through the desert, dying of thirst and ill, and say, may they not come to misfortune, may they be saved. Even so, one looks at someone like this, saying, may they be helped, may they not come to misfortune. And one looks towards one pure in body and pure in speech, as one would encounter an oasis in a pond and bathing in the pond, having drunk their fill, lying to, lie down on the bank and rest. So I love that sutta. And 
you'll notice a few things. One is that in the situation where they encounter someone impure of body, the monk doesn't use their hands to pick up the cloth. They use their feet to tear it off. So you can keep your distance where it's necessary. You don't need to associate with people who have unskillful behavior too much. And yet you can still look to the good. You can still take what's good and give attention to that. And then, this is so beautiful, is, is in each of the other two situations where they gently clear away the algae or press their lips to the water, they're so careful to not stir up the person. So when you encounter those people who are on edge, where there's this difficulty, how gentle can you be? How much can you be spacious around those beings? And yet, in each case, after the person has drunk their fill, they walk on, they don't stay. So you don't need to associate with those difficult patterns more than is necessary. The only situation in that analogy, in that simile, where the person remains is at the oasis. There they lie down on the bank. And I only realized this after reading the Pali very recently. But the word that the Buddha uses for the person who cups the water to their hands, to their mouth, is anjali. They're making anjali to the person. And what's the motion of the person who bends their mouth to the hoof print? It's a full bow. So just as Saka approaches that demon with humility and kindness, the more kind of volatile someone is, the more gently, the more humbly you can approach. And this doesn't mean you don't put up boundaries. This doesn't mean you don't establish uh, you know, relevant skillful means. It doesn't mean you associate more than you need to with unskillful people. And yet, it means that as practitioners, can you approach those interactions with a sense of kindness and spaciousness? And yet, protection is important there too. And this is where sila, morality, comes in. The Buddha said the benefit of morality is one approaches any assembly without fear. And one dies unconfused. One approaches any assembly without fear, and one dies unconfused. And you feel this, is that when you compromise your ethics, when you break sila, you've suddenly bought into the transient world, and you're vulnerable. There's a real sense of danger, and in Buddhist terminology, it's called an okasa, an opening from Mara. Those moments, and you can feel the visceral fear, at least I can, when you aren't walking in line with Dhamma, when you know you've done something you shouldn't have, you're vulnerable to the world in a way you weren't. And yet, like Long Por Cha said, if you protect the precepts, the precepts will protect you. And often, there's this conceit with kind of a secular morality that's not very well articulated of like, oh, it's good enough. You know, most people behave well enough. And it's true. In normal circumstances, most people do. But if you read about when things go bad, um, in Schultzenitzen's The Gulag Archipelago, uh, Schultzenitzen talks about these, the work camps in Russia and how this brutal situation, and yet these few beings who had a clearly articulated morality that they would not budge on. He specifically mentions a former soil engineer named Gregory Ivanovich Grigoriev. And he says this man's, mon uh, man's honesty was monstrous. He, uh, there was a situation, it's all these starving prisoners and they're put in charge of cleaning out a, I think it was like a tipped over um, railway car with a bunch of potatoes. And of course, the other prisoners who were starving were taking some potatoes and just eating them to get enough food. And yet Gregory wouldn't touch them because he, he wouldn't steal. Um, there were situations where he was going to be put in charge of work groups instead of having to break rocks. And yet to do that, he'd be forced to fudge the books just a little bit. And Schultzenitzen said he just he wouldn't do it. And so he got down there and he broke rocks with the rest of us. And he speaks about this man who was just untouched. And this is what it means to have refuge. What does it mean 
to have a sila, a morality so firm and well articulated with the five precepts that nothing would break and to realize that true safety and a feeling of refuge doesn't come from thinking the city will never burn, but knowing that even if it did, you would not do anything unskillful to preserve. You'd always protect your morality. You'd always remember first and foremost where your refuge lies. And the Buddha said there are five kinds of loss, relatives, health, wealth, morality, and right view. The first three are trifling, he said. Well, you will lose your relatives, you will lose your wealth, you will lose your health, but morality and right view, those are precious. So this is our armor. And there really is a sense that even the most difficult, painful forces in the world, even the darkest, if you keep your ethics, you're in some sense untouchable. And I think that's true to an extent if you have something that you care about more than your life, and that's the pure heart, then, then what can really touch you? And then there's the ultimate in, oh, and I would also say that in um, Christian conceptions, the uh, Christians talk about how demons uh, they do talk about possession, and they talk about how when a demon possesses someone, it's a specific, they're given a specific domain that they can uh, push the person on by God, and that this is God's way of teaching someone, of strengthening them. So say someone has a certain weakness for this or that, and the Christian conception, um, at least in certain circles, would be that the demon would take up possession of someone, but only to push them in that area so that they could truly become strong and learn to be invulnerable in that area, to push them at their weakest spot. And I think that's such a beautiful way of looking at those particular difficulties in our lives. The Mahayana believes that the bodhisattvas can split off pieces of their mind and send them down as the difficult boss, the drunk on the side of the street, the difficult partner, all in order to teach us. And what happens if we really look to the deepest shadow in our lives, not with a sense of kind of gritting our teeth and just getting by, but really as something to be grateful for in the sense that without that thread of suffering, of shadow, where would we learn to develop the calm and loving heart? Where would we grow in these qualities of patience and kindness? What impetus would we have to have the mind and the brightness of heart unweave itself from the cloth of conditioned existence? If it was all such perfect patterning, what motivation would there be? What friction for us to look for refuge that was deeper? And so can we really see each of these deep shadows in our life as a gift in the sense of something given to us to develop deeper depth of heart, deeper patience? And I've talked often about the... Uh, you know, monk I lived with for a time who would admonish me for everything from closing the door too loudly to wearing my socks wrong. This wasn't Ajahn Kovilo. Um, <laughs> and, and how annoying it was until I realized that if I had a senior teacher giving me that kind of attention with such care to my every action, I would consider it the most profound gift. And so from then on, I really tried to hold for that whole year that monk as that teacher to me. And it was one of the most, I mean, my meditation and that monk were the best lessons I had from that entire year. And this is, for me, the essence of the Four Noble Truths, that first noble truth's directive to comprehend dukkha, to place your hands on suffering, on imperfection, and to comprehend and let go of its cause craving. If you are willing to turn towards 
imperfection with that view of understanding it and taking it as a stepping stone on the path, an alchemy occurs where the heart can grow and it truly can push one deeper towards awakening. And I've never seen a limit to how far that logic can be taken. People can encounter the most profound difficulties. And if there's, if they're able to turn to it in that way, and you see this in the Gulag Archipelago, you see this in Monk Mose in the prisons in Soviet Russia, you see this in people who have navigated some of the most brutal situations in the world, and this is not, you know, trying to make light of what tragedy people encounter, but just to say that if for ourselves we can look towards the demons in our lives as something sent by the Dhamma to give us learning and strength, and I often reference that uh, teacher Gurdjieff who had in his community one really problematic member who annoyed everyone. And one day they were in the middle of a work project and the person just went one step too far and they chased him away. And Gurdjieff came back and said, where's, where's this, this guy? And they said, oh, we, we were done with him, we just chased him away. And Gurdjieff said, bring him back right now, I pay him to be here. <laughs> and, and can we really look at that, you know? The Dhamma not as this punishing hand, but rather as the exact, an offering palm, handing us just the lesson we need to learn. Can our hearts be wide enough for that? And my experience is the Dhamma will always hand you just up to your limit, but never more, never more. So I really find the deeper you can look to the shadow, or acknowledge it, the more brilliant the light can become. And the more urgency we have, you know, we can either exist in this realm where practice is an accessory, where the dukkha of our life is, you know, just a minor inconvenience and our practice a small hobby. Or we can realize the depth of the, tr the catastrophe we can realize what human birth is. This is a good birth. This is a good rebirth. Upper middle class existence is pretty David-like. <laughs> and yet the danger is that we forget the full picture. The tragedy, each person here, so many, and you hear this as a, especially as a monk with people coming with even the best people with the most clear, clean lives on the surface. There's so much self-hatred underneath. There's so much tragedy, so much trauma, so much loss so many orphanings by loved ones, by parents, by children. And can we really understand that only by making the heart broad enough to hold that whole catastrophe, can we understand the depth of the brightness and gift we've been given in this teaching and the purpose we've been granted? So it's not exactly, you know, feeding the demons, but it's understanding that we can protect ourselves where necessary, but also understand them as spurs and uh, in some strange sense partners on this path. So wish you all the best. Handamayam damakataya sadhu karam dadamase sadhu 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 Animodami. Okay, so um, people can stand up and move if you need to or shift a, a bit. And uh, we have time for questions now, so we'll have a mic runner and just raise your hand if you'd like to speak or ask. And then if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand too. Yes, Dan. Hi, John. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, regards to malevolence in the world, I, um, you know, I, I, is it out there? Does it exist? Sure, in my mind it does, and, and I feel it, and I see it. But it, for me, it's also a slippery slope because I feel like um, I could easily become, like, uh, uh, judgmental and critical of that, uh, those forces, and the self-righteous righteous indignation comes up. And, and also, like, what, how powerless I feel 
about making any kind of change, meaningful change in that. I'm, I'm, it's very limited and it's like so. So I think real quick, I mean, rarely do I look at uh, popular culture for powerful metaphors and wisdom, uh, but uh, sometimes it's nailed really well. And I was thinking of real quick, um, the, Star, the original Star Wars trilogy and in Return of the Jedi, right? So there's Yoda, the archetypical master, let's say, urging Luke to go inside the cave, and overcome his fear, and see what's inside. And what does the cave represent? You know, consciousness, all that. And what does Luke find inside the cave is his enemy, Darth Vader, and they fight, right? And then he cuts off his head. Luke cuts off Darth Vader's head and he takes off the helmet, the mask, and what does he see? He see, Luke sees his own face, his own head. So I think about malevolence in that way, so yes, it's out there, yes, I can be upset about it, but I have to turn it back on myself and say, what really is my true enemy? Is it the darkness in the world, or is it my own Greed, anger, and ignorance, the ignorance that you spoke of, that I find um, is the true battle and the true malevolence. And yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say, really. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And uh, I love Star Wars references. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, and to be honest, this is the first time I've tried to speak about this in this way. And I don't know how the language is going to land totally, but... Um, yeah, no, the slippery slope is well, well put. And, you know, when I think we do begin to have that sense of condescension or something, to really look that it's us not acknowledging conditionality. Like, if you trace someone's history back far enough, you will, you know, we all have that experience with understanding someone's childhood and the difficulty they went through and then understanding why they are the way they are now and just the compassion. And there's always, like if we really understood someone's history, um, we'd understand where the Sankara come from. And, and I think that's really important is that any sense of conceit or condescension or othering is never appropriate. Um, because you're right, it could, there's another suit to where the Buddha said, one should look at those fallen on hard times and think, even I too have been in just this situation in the course of this long, long time. And the equivalence of self and other there is so meaningful. And the acknowledgement that if we have so much trouble behaving as beautifully as we wish we would with all the teachings we've been exposed to with a meditation practice, you know, how much more difficult for someone who hasn't been exposed to any of the Buddhist teachings and not said in a condescending way, but they're pretty great teachings. And I know that most of us aren't quite where we wish we were. So, yeah, I think that's completely correct. And it's a fine line with balancing that sense of empathy and compassion with acknowledging that some of those patterns out there really are very dark. And just being able to speak to that every now and again, I think, is important. But your caution is well warranted, and I think a really great way of putting it. Yes. Yes. Uh, person on Zoom whose face I... Hello, Monday. Who is and it? Hello, everyone. Oh, Gudis, please. Uh, I'm, first of all, I would like to thank everyone. It is an opportunity to, for, for me to join in this wholesome group, which is making, which uh, all of them are making a wholesome mind from this Dhamma talk and walking on the path. Today, just I would like to share five recollections with permission of Bante. Uh, Bante, I would like to share five recollections. Can I share, Bante? Um, we do have to make sure there's time for others to ask questions, Gudas. Or is it going to uh, be quick? Uh, one thing is like, uh, uh, just I was reading one sutta. There, uh, it has come over. Like, uh, we are subjected to old age and we are not exempt from old age. And we are subjected to illness. We are not exempt from illness. This is really inspiring, uh, Bante. Just I would like, just I uh, have shared this to all. Oh, thank, thank you, Goodis. Those actually, I love the five recollections, and we we do chant those actually almost weekly or daily at monasteries. And 
No, there's something very settling about the heart in, in that and increased urgency. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Thanking you all. Wishing all happiness. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Gary. Thank you for the presentation. You, you expressed a little wonder about how did it land. And I wanted to share with you what was landing for me as you spoke. Most of us have seen in full color the attack that was made on the Capitol a few years ago. Some of us are old enough to have seen in black and white on live television the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I'm aware um, John Lewis, who we recently lost, for about 60 years since then, would tell the story of what occurred. They all practiced in real life what these actions would be and how they would respond. They faced the evil before it occurred in their lives. But they also matched that with meditation. They went inside and found what was going on. And so, as John Lewis was being beaten over the head viciously, he would look back at the person and say, I will not let you make me hate you. Mm. And that's the vision that I had as you were speaking of how real this is that we face, but we also learn by facing it. And if they had not faced it before, they wouldn't have been there to make that response. And he carried that with him and showed it to us all those decades since before he died. So thank you for helping that land that way for me. Thank you, Gary. Person on Zoom. Mary, sorry. Hi, Ajahn. Hello, everybody. Um, I also really appreciated your talk. It landed well with me. Um, and it reminded me of something. It's not a question, but I'd like to share a recollection. Um, when you were talking about the demonic and the way Saka went up and just bowed to the little demon on the throne, it reminded me, and finding the good, being humble and finding the good, it reminded me of uh, something I learned early in my training in um, mental health nursing. And that was a story of Eric Erickson, who grew up to be the great hypnot hypnotist therapist. And when he was just a resident at VA hospital, he had a patient who had been there for like 20 years with this delusion of being Jesus Christ. And it was intractable. They couldn't break it. And this guy just went around living his life um, on this mental health unit. Um, until Erickson got there and came up to him one day and said, I hear you've had some experience as a carpenter. Mm. And the guy said, well, I have. And so he included, he said, well, I need some help in work in woodshop. And he started him, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour. So finally the guy was functional working in as a carpenter for like eight to 10 hours a day happily. Um, and that made uh, an impression on me when I was a nursing student. Um, and I have find it very helpful in my own practice when I'm caught in some delusional state to think there is a functional part here. What is the functional part that I can expand? And so I simply offer that as, as um, my, my one of my reactions to your very beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That's that's such a good story. It would work with someone who thinks they are Peter too, but it'd be hard to keep the first precept with that one with the fisherman. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you. <laughs> 